Within the last two years, a major new style of rhetoric emerged in the vegan movement. And one person deserves more credit than anyone else for the emergence of that style. A young man named Isaac, his YouTube channel is called Ask Yourself. I'm going to give this method, known as the Name the Trait method, the highest praise possible in this video. And that goes as follows. This approach to explaining veganism and challenging non-vegans about their belief systems is going to become ubiquitous and invisible in veganism the same way that wrenches and hammers and nail guns all hang on the wall of the tool shop as different types of tools appropriate for different types of activities. When a new tool is first discovered or announced or tried out, there will be a brief period of enthusiasm and maybe even a period when people are overestimating how useful that new tool is. Like, you know, when computers are first invented and you think computers are going to help you wash the dishes. Well, it doesn't quite work that way. But it turns out computers have all kinds of other uh, applications in our life. Likewise, there are different tools for different tasks. But the emergence of this method, of this style of rhetoric within veganism, I think is a permanent addition to our toolbox. And it's a tool that certain types of people engaged in certain types of advocacy are going to go to again and again. Now, implicit in this praise, this is this is high praise for me, but it is limited praise. As I said from my very first encounter with this method on Isaac's channel, it's an approach that's only going to work for certain personality types and for sol solving certain types of problems. So I have now seen Isaac deploying this type of rhetoric, engaging with meat eaters, engaging in debates live from various angles and from with various types of people. If there is one problem that the name the trait argument does not solve, if there's one bridge it can't cross or, I don't know, one issue it can't broach, it is the fundamental problem of, I don't care. It's the fundamental problem of talking to someone whose counter-argument to you is neither logical nor emotional, is neither based on an appeal to tradition, nor them explaining how much they love the taste of meat, where fundamentally what you're up against is indifference. Um, I think Isaac is more aware than anyone else that his style of rhetoric can't overcome that obstacle. However, it can come very close to convincing people to try veganism or convert to being vegan, depending on what ideals those people are already committed to, um, what values they hold, and in many cases values they hold that they've never examined or questioned themselves. I would not want to speculate on what kind of personality it is that gets drawn in and fascinated by the, the name the trait argument. And it's fair to say I am not that kind of personality. If anything, I think I underestimated just how many people this is a useful tool for, for dealing with. Um, because to me, the type of issue name the trait engages with or challenge, challenges people on is extremely obvious. It's not, like, to me, the issue is being raised, like, yeah, of course, it's so obvious. But I'm the kind of person who doesn't need to be talked into veganism, right? I, in many ways, I'm, I'm a very unusual person, I think, psychologically as well as, as intellectually. So what I'm going to find interesting, what I'm going to find intriguing, or what I'm going to find challenging is very, very different from the, the mass of humanity. It's very different from the majority of people who are even on the internet engaging in these discussions. And let's point out again, the type of person who will come on the internet and engage in a debate of this kind is very different from your own grandmother, whoever you are watching this. Yes, it's possible I'm saying this to the one person in a million whose grandmother is literally on Isaac's Discord server every night listening to these debates and trying to talk about vegan ethics and morality and philosophy. I doubt it. So there are generational gaps, there are subcultural gaps that separate people for whom this approach works and for whom it doesn't. I have to say also, I really never saw any use for a so-called consistency test before. But Isaac has used this argument on me to actually prove to me that my own views about veganism were more consistent than I thought they were. Isaac has cross-examined me several times where I said, look, my own philosophy has flaws and inconsistencies, something I'm quite willing to kind of warmly admit or, you know, approach with people and say, look, I have my own limitations. I have points where I say, sorry, babe. Yeah, there's construction noise coming from the window. Thanks. Um, that's the problem with having a higher quality microphone. We're going to pick up noise pollution more accurately than ever. 
there are points where I'm quite willing to say to people in a warm, down-to-earth tone, um, I don't have all the answers, or I, I make a hypocrite out of myself in this circumstance or that circumstance. And it's interesting that I've been cross-examined by Isaac, where he said to me, no, you think you're being inconsistent, but you're not, because you would actually apply the same standard to a human being. So I had, for example, one of the inconsistencies in my own philosophy, as I described it, I would always point out to people that if a bear climbs into a human home, comes into a human basement and is trying to eat the garbage or trying to eat the food out of the kitchen or something, a problem that's common enough in Canada, this is a situation where I believe in having to resort to violence as a vegan. I would prefer if the bear can be tranquilized and removed without harm to the forest, but in real world reality, very often we end up hurting these bears or indeed just killing these bears um, because we don't have an economically affordable, better method. Now, ask yourself, flipped the, the name that trade argument um, against me in this situation. He said, but how does that differ from how you would treat a human being in the same circumstance? If there's a human being who is uh, crazed or brain damaged or so high on drugs that their behavior is really similar to a bear. They're in a state of, of uh, rage, insensate rage or what have you, thrashing around in a house, eating the garbage or whatever it is. They've broken in the window and you can't extricate them nonviolently. Don't you think that even though it's tragic, even though you'd prefer to see them shot with a tranquilizer gun and removed without harming them, don't you likewise think that the use of violence is applicable to a human being in the circumstance the same way that it would be applied to a bear? That, for me, was a totally original thought that I, I had never questioned my own philosophy in that way. And I had to stop and realize, okay, this idea of applying a consistency test to how do we solve problems in the human ethical sphere and then applying that mutatis mutandis to the animal eth ethical sphere this is obviously something that can be pretty powerful and revelatory for a variety of, of human personality types. I have seen directly meat eaters who are deeply committed to the ideal of their own philosophical sophistication, who, whose ego is attached to the notion of being logical and consistent. I have seen them drawn into questioning their own morality, questioning veganism, and then actually adopting veganism by this argument. Now, to me, that is very alien. I came into this, I discussed this in an immediately prior video, I came into veganism already wanting to make a positive difference in the world. So I'm, in the, I'm, in the, I'm at the diametric opposite end of the spectrum from someone who starts off in the position that they don't care or that they're just trying to enjoy their life, they just want to maximize their experience of pleasure and they don't care about the consequences. I'm at the opposite extreme where my perspective is... Um, I'm looking to save the planet, and it's not clear to me if I can do that through uh, ecological activism, um, through something like activism that's that's linked to trying to regrow the forest or limit deforestation or something like that, or what kind of method I should use. And then I encounter and start to fasten onto vegan activism as as one way to to make progress, one way to to advocate for, for whatever, save the planet, address uh, serious you know ethical and ecological and political issues in in our in our time. Um, However, the bulk of people are at all times only applying the limited part of their brain that deals with ethics to human ethical problems. So I think it's clear that for, for many types of people, getting them to apply that same part of their brain, the same moral habits and values that they've cultivated to people, and then to apply them to animals and to question if there's an asymmetry between the two, of what value is it? Now, again, this is this is totally alien to me. Okay, I should say, all right, we'll do this one step at a time here. One of the most common scenarios that uh, Isaac deals with, that is dealt with on Ask Yourself's YouTube channel and in his, his live debates, his Discord server and so on, is that he will challenge people, why do they treat a pig differently from a human being, given that a pig uh, is about as intelligent as a three-year-old child. Three-year-old human child is about the same intelligence as an adult pig, this kind of thing. And very often the, the response will be, not always, but very often people will say that they justify killing animals for meat because animals are less intelligent than human beings. And then the question inevitably becomes, would you or would you not accept making mentally disabled people into hamburgers? Um, so if, if, there are, if there is a population of people on the earth, and there is, who are so mentally retarded that they're at the level 
of a pig or below the level of a pig. If they're, if they're at the dotted line, wherever you draw, draw the dotted line, at the intelligence of a cow or a pig, would you kill those people and mash them up uh, to make hamburgers or whatever? And I have seen how people react to this challenge. Now, again, me, it, it proves to me, again, I, you know, I've always been aware to some extent, I'm, I'm an eccentric, but to some, each of the people engaged in this conversation, they're eccentrics also. There's obviously a certain personality type or a certain category of people within our culture. And maybe it's disproportionately the type of people who play video games, the type of people who spend long hours on the internet. Maybe it's disproportionately people who grow up, I think, frankly, on a kind of ego trip that they're philosophically sophisticated because of things they've read on the internet that were better than the education of philosophy they received in formal school or you know better than their, their own teachers, their own would-be role models um, lacked the kind of philosophical sophistication. That there are people whose sense of self-esteem is really predicated on feeling that they're right. And being guided through this kind of Q&A session for them, um, I've seen the kind of transformative and highly motivating effect that it can have. So what is the future for the name that trait argument? I'm sorry, I prefer to say that trait. It's name the trait, um, this, style of, this style of rhetoric. I do think that like any new tool, and it is a new tool. Sorry, I've got to come back to that. It, once its novelty has worn off, it does to some extent fade in the background. It's just another tool that's up on the shelf. And probably when you're talking to your grandmother, it's not going to be a tool you're going to go to and use. And when you're talking to another type of person, maybe it's a tool you're going to try. It's a way to broach the topic that you're going to deal with. And it's a way in which you and a vegan may be better prepared for some of the anti-vegan arguments you deal with face-to-face. -to, -face. to what extent is this a new tool? Because again, I'm giving Isaac more credit than he claims for himself here. Uh, I think it is dramatically and fundamentally a new tool because when this line of reasoning was employed by Peter Singer, Peter Singer, who is in many ways an anti-vegan intellectual, who is mistaken for vegan. Peter Singer's argument went in the exact opposite direction. His argument was that any sense of moral obligation towards another person should be based entirely on their level of cognition. And he put the dotted line, the line between human and subhuman, much, much higher than the level of cognition that a pig has or that a retarded person might have. Peter Singer is the ultimate example of someone who openly and flagrantly says that children born with uh, mental disabilities have no rights and can and should be exterminated. And in his own intentionally careless wording, he goes out of his way to say that um, such a child, a retarded child, and it's again, it's he's how how retarded does the child need to be for this to be true? As long as the parents would have another child with better prospects, quote-unquote better prospects, then the first child can be eliminated. So this obviously quite intentionally leaves the door open to infanticide for children with pretty minor forms of mental impairment or, or mental retardation. He's not at all uh, putting the, the line that low. And Peter Singer takes this further to say, Peter Singer's position was and still is and always has been, that he has no objection to people killing animals and no objection to people eating meat he simply wants these animals to be treated decently or with decency. And his standards for decency, of course, from my perspective, are completely surreal. You know, <laughs> they live their whole life on a farm castrated in a, in a cage, and then one day someone comes and slits their throat. I mean, how, how decent can this possibly be? So, you know, I, I think it's not enough to just say that Isaac came along and put the finishing touches on something Peter Singer did imperfectly previously. I think that Isaac has really transcended and transformed a deeply flawed and immoral argument that Peter Singer presented. I, I don't know what his thought process was when he, when he came up with this. And I, I see no resemblance between what Isaac is now doing and ancient authors like Porphyry. I had, I had a good translation of Porphyry here in my apartment for quite some time. I, I'm just being honest with you. I do think that this is actually really an innovative and new style of rhetoric, style of Socratic dialogue, or style of, of cross-examination. And uh, I, I'm sorry, I've heard Isaac say this in his own terms. It, earlier, I said, it does not broach the problem of, I don't care. It's not going to broach the problem of a fundamental lack of motivation. 
if you're talking to someone who who you know has no motivation to do good rather than evil or to care about negative outcomes rather than having no outcomes or positive or someone who wants to take no responsibility for the consequences of their actions however it's really interesting for me to see that very often the next steps that follow after this conversation come back to my core philosophy on this channel which is of asking the person what kind of person do you want to be what what kind of character do you think you are or what kind of character do you do you want to have? Um, for me, that's very often the first question in, in, in the discourse of veganism, not the final one. But it's interesting that it comes at the end of the discourse in Isaac's rhetorical style um, because the process of questioning why would you treat animals differently from human beings? What is the trait that justifies your treating animals differently from human beings? In many ways, indirectly, it does get at the question of, to you, what does it mean to be human? What is your sense of yourself as a person? What is your sense of yourself in terms of the unique human responsibility you have that, of course, makes you different from a lion, that makes you different from a shark, that makes you different from a monkey in the jungle or an ant burrowing under the earth? There's obviously some sense in which you're aware of yourself having agency and having responsibility, perhaps moral and ethical responsibility or however you want to, to style it. There's something you feel that marks you out as a person and as an individual and perhaps the human species as a whole or most of it. And then the question is not merely descriptively, what is that difference? But prescriptively, what do you want that difference to be? What do you think humanity is capable of? Because it's not just this. And what do you think you're capable of? Not just what's the minimum standard at which human beings should not be thrown in prison. But what do you think the maximum standard is that you aspire to? So I have seen this played out, and I can say, uh, name the trait. It's not one tool that fixes all problems. It's not going to fix a leaky faucet and at the same time, you know, uh, seal up the bottom of a leaky boat. Different tool set for different kinds of problems. But I do think that what Isaac has done, and it's, it's very indicative of how important YouTube and the internet are in the 21st century, in contrast to new ideas coming into the movement through court cases, like the founding of, of PETA, in, in contrast to things coming to the movement through, you know, low-end terrorist groups like the ALF or what have you, or ideas coming to the movement through formal academic publications and books. We're now into an era where I think major new ideas, new directions that the movement takes on, and new styles of rhetoric, new ways of engaging the issue, they are emerging on the internet, first and foremost, and in, and in this, this kind of discourse. So I have no idea what Isaac is going to do next with his career. I suspect he'll get bored of YouTube and go back to university and uh, pr pursue other careers. But I do think this is a permanent addition to, uh, to vegan discourse. And it's an incredibly positive development compared to what I've seen even just in the last six years, say, the last 10, 15 years. Veganism has gone through various fads. And most of them have come and gone without leaving any permanent addition to our toolkit. So, Isaac, here's to you.